уважаемый Дарья Расматор, я хочу приветствовать вас на нашей конференции, цель которой является критически переосмыслить Октябрьскую революцию и революционный период и их идеи. Я хочу сначала благодарить в первую очередь нашей команды, команды фонда Фредрих Ниберта, именно Динара Халибикизи и Арнику Бальнун, которые отвечают за логистики и организации. И без помощи и поддержки которых организация этого конференция не предназначена. Но я тоже хочу поблагодарить двум коллегам, именно Чайс Баксен, директор СБО «Интрак», и Георгий Мамедов, художественный руководитель НПО «Штаба», которые были готовы вложить их интеллектуальную мощь и опыт на разработку концепции этой конференции. Спасибо вам, Чарли и Георгий. Так, доклады к первой части конференции стремляются на то, чтобы осветить вклад деятелей, которые способствовали продвижению и распространению революционных идей в Центральной Азии, а также главные интеллектуальные тренды 19 и начала 20 веков. На самом деле мы хотим, и это будет именно во второй части конференции, обсудить вопрос связи между революционными идеями начала 20 века и сегодняшними визовами для гражданского общества. Может ли прогрессивный потенциал Октябрьской революции быть задействован гражданскими активистами и институтами гражданского общества в постсоветском Кыргызстане? И если да, то каким образом? Но до, до этого давайте посмотрим на вопрос, как вообще, вообще применить изучение о стране революции, революции в Центральной Азии и как восстание 1916 года относится к Советской революции, к Океанской революции. Этим вопросом Посвящен основный доклад Али Игмена, профессор э, и доцент по Центрально-Азиатской истории и директор, директор программы по устной истории Калифорнийского государственного университета Лондонбич. Али Игмен, автор книга известного, э, разговаривает по советски с акцентом «Культура и власть в Кыргызстане» и он тоже является автором других работ о революционном периоде в Центральной Азии. Я сразу передам слово Али Игмен. Пожалуйста. Добро пожаловать even though I studied those for many years, now it's, they're both very rusty, so excuse me for presenting in English. Um, but uh, for the sake of uh, clarification, I put some of the points up in the PowerPoint, so if you, uh, it will be helpful to follow. But first I'd like to thank the um, uh, um, Andrea, and Chenara and uh, Dinara, but also obviously uh, both Charles, uh, Charles, uh, Charles Buxton and Georgi Mamedov. So uh, this is a, 
such an opportune moment for me because I work specifically, uh, uh, as Andrea pointed out, um, my first book was on uh, Houses of Culture, Dom Kulturi or Medeniyet Yuri. Now I'm actually working on uh, four actresses that were very dear to Kyrgyz uh, populations. Uh, they are called the uh, Kyrgyz in Turkish. Uh, daughters, four daughters of the Kyrgyz. And I will talk about them briefly. But today's uh, topic is really about the revolution. And my interest is uh, to discuss scholars scholarship on revolts and revolutions, the Western scholarship mostly, and how we may see or examine both the revolts, Kazakh Kyrgyz revolts, as Kyrgyz and Kazakhs called in 1916, and of course the revolutions that followed uh, the, uh, that period. So, let me begin. Um, some archival sources indicate that the Bolshevik Revolution did not reach some parts of Kyrgyzstan as rapidly as it did Tashkent or other major centers. I'm referring to the influence and practice of the revolution on the everyday lives, uh, just pointed out, everyday lives of Kyrgyz populations. When the local Soviets uh, initiated a new way of uh, life in Kyrgyzstan, even the most ardent enthusiasts had some degree of difficulty applying the revolution to their communities. Although uh, local revolutionary leaders established Lenin cor Lenin's corners, red yurts, uh, or other gatherings in factories and other places to introduce uh, Marxist Lenin's ideas to their populations, they had meager material support as simple as pamphlets, books, posters, and others coming from the center. So when I looked at some of the archival materials here in Bishkek and also in Osh, uh, I would see from 1920s on, many local administrators would write to the center. Center might be, you know, Almaty or Tashkent or some other regional center, complaining that they didn't have enough materials to support the revolution. So, um, but when we think about Marxist Lenin's ideas at that time, of course Lenin's idea of a vanguard communist party was essential, right? It was his sort of new way of looking at the, the ideology. So he needed to actually gather people to work as vanguard uh, in the party to establish this new system. Um, so I found many letters in the archives, <coughs> and they continuously appealed, you know, these people who are going to be vanguard individuals to support the revolution, they would write to the center for more support. These correspondences show that there was a respectable amount of support for the revolution in many corners of Kyrgyzstan, but uh, there existed significant reticence, opposition, and sometimes animosity among some populations against outside influences. So this is an important point here. The, what they were against, were they against specifically the Russians, were they against the Bolsheviks, or simply were they against outsiders trying to initiate some change. So one may, might argue that it may have had an impact of 1916 Urkuna. Uh, it may have had, uh, you know, original, uh, basically originated uh, from the opposition to late imperial forces. Uh, so let me visit that shortly. The opposition to the imperial Russian administration among the, among the Central Asian populations, no matter what the reasons were, according to scholars, resulted in massive numbers of casualties. All ethnicities suffered large number of deaths, including the Russian sailors who were in the region. One scholar who studied before anybody else, at least in English, 
uh, Edward Davis Sokolov, who wrote about the revolts as early as 1954. And um, he argued 270,000 people died during the revolt. And he also argued about 40% of the Kyrgyz population perished. So this, these numbers, of course, have been debated, discussed, and now, as you probably know, there are many conferences on this period, and some publications are coming out. So let's put this in a larger context. The 1916 revolt in Kyrgyzstan was neither an aberration nor unique, especially for the 20th century. When we place this experience in the global historical context of the last century, we might find, uh, we may find many commonalities between this particular revolt and other revolts around the world. Let me start with the discussion on the scholarship of the definitions of revolts versus uh, revolutions. Um, I'm going to talk about some other scholars who don't necessarily study the particular October Revolution, but other revolutions. First of all, David A. Schaefer, a historian of France, wrote in his book, The Paris Commune, I'm going to quote now, although riots and revolutions are both initiated by a problem, revolutions transcend the limitations of the immediate crisis situating it instead as integral to the overall structure of society and as a contest for authority in the public space. Schaeffer argues that the French Revolution would have not succeeded without the enthusiastic and active support of Parisians. So, if I follow uh, um, Schaeffer's lead, I investigate the nature of the 1916 uprisings in Kyrgyzstan and the rest of Central Asia, and I ask how one may measure successful support of rebels and revolutionaries that help them turn into an uprising, turn an uprising into a revolution. So just to clarify that, how does a revolt become a revolution? What are the factors? Um, so, I ask, how do we understand this era of resistance and revolt that clashed with the Bolshevik Revolution from the point of view of established theories and to analyze the revolts, re rebellions, and revolutions in the 20th century? French Revolution and other revolutions are, of course, studied widely, as opposed to what happened in Kyrgyzstan. You know, we have very little, especially in English or other Western languages. So the most of the world are kind of almost always unaware of what happened in this region in terms of uh, revolutionary politics. So. Um, in order to understand uh, the revolutions, I'm going to move into what I will argue, is that we cannot fully understand the 1916 revolt and later the 1917 revolution without a multidisciplinary approach. I'm trained as a historian, but I am now looking at other fields political science, sociology, anthropology, to be able to understand what happened, not just from a historian's point of view, but from all points of view. So we need to consider theoretical approaches that go beyond uh, those that focus on state versus society, or elite versus ordinary people. I think these are too simplistic to be able to understand what happened in this region. So there are some key components to studying revolts, including an engagement with theories of structuralism, 
state-oriented approaches, uh, self-determination, opportunity, autonomy. These are important factors to be able to understand uh, revolutions. And when we look at scholarship on revolts, we also need to look at cultural causes and cultural results of revolts and revolutions. And it is also important to study elite competition, how elites during you know, any moments of revolution competed with each other to gain power. And also we have to obviously look at mass mobilization. If they were not able to mobilize the populations behind them, whether or not these revolutions would be successful. And equally important, there need to be, uh, we need to study demographics, we need to study race, we need to study class, and individual revolution is, individual people who participated in their characteristics. Uh, I don't like this word, the third world, but scholars use it. So the third world peculiarities. But we also need to look at gender. And today there will be a discussion, as I look at the program, specifically on female gender revolution. So, um, Basically, my presentation is an invitation and a proposal to think within theoretical terms rather than comprehensive treatment of all theories to apply the revolution. One important figure, many of you who are from Kyrgyzstan will recognize Samira Kumshalyeva here. Uh, I was lucky enough to interview her before she passed away in 2007. Uh, you know, my work is on theater uh, and uh, individuals who participated in theater and film. During my interview with Sabir Kumshadeva in 2002, I learned that she was a relative of Mother Mimbek, a revolutionary leader who initiated a revolution in Margila in a present day Uzbekistan in 1918 against the Bolsheviks. So, this striking information made me think about what constituted a revolt as opposed to a revolution. And it sparked an interest in exploring what made a rebellion a revolution. Right now, there is a, because as, just as you put this conference together, there's a great interest in terms of revisiting uh, 1970. Two scholars who uh, participated on um, the Russian Revolution, uh, the rewriting of Revol Revolution uh, in the West are one Steve A. Smith and the other one is Mark D. Steinberg. Steve's uh, work is from 2002 and Steinberg's work just came out this year. Um, I don't know if you have access to uh, getting these uh, materials but they are um, important especially for those of us who teach, uh, especially um, Steve uh, Smith's work is one of those small volumes that are uh, considered, um, it's Oxford, Oxford series, a uh, very short introduction series from Oxford Press. What does he argue about the Russian Revolution? Those of you, those of, uh, you know, when we are teaching classes on the revolution, um, we need to, if students never read this material, we need to actually summarize in short terms and specify what was unique about the Russian Revolution. According to Smith, um, historians need to examine the lives and responses of ordinary people to be able to understand the Russian Revolution. He pointed out that Bolsheviks were firmly committed to an evolutionist view of social development. Let me repeat, evolutionist view of social development. He argues, therefore, that the revolution went hand in hand with an attack on, I'm putting in quotation marks as he did, backward aspects of Central Asian societies and cultures. 
So his argument is, with this very Marxist ideology of the revolution in politics, uh, in revolution in Central Asia also followed this trend. If you look at Mark Steinberg's work, which is this year's book, uh, also published by Oxford, he analyzed the revolution as personal and emotional experiences. His argument is, we studied the Russian Revolution too, for too long as a structural political event. He argues that we now need to look at the revolution from the emotions, from the personal experiences, otherwise we will not be able to really put the Russian Revolution and the October Revolution in Central Asia in context. So, his book tells us about uh, what he calls unmaking of empire, taking a part of empire. And he takes uh, three individuals in his book, uh, for us today, much more important than the others perhaps, Mahmoud Khoja Behbudi, and he takes uh, the Ukrainian uh, individual Vladimir Vinichenko, and then of course Isaac Babe. So he takes three individuals and looks at their experiences point, from the point of view of the, you know, how their lives were affected or how they affected the revolution. So, of course, his approach to Behbudi's life is most helpful in understanding the events of the transition from the empire to the Bolshevik era for Muslims of the empire. Steinberg reminds us that there were almost 14 million Muslims in the empire at the end of the century. Therefore, it is important to note the diversity among the populations and wealth of ideas in this population. He argues, this is an important point, maybe you will be debating this, he argues that Islam was invented as an ethnic and national category by the Bolsheviks. And it, basically, he argues, they didn't really invent it, but they followed the ethnographers. They came before them in the empire, but they expanded on that. So, but, he argues Muslim reformists, like Behbudi, and activists constructed this category for different reasons than the state. I argue, Kyrgyz individuals, too, had their own reasons and methods to construct their own modern identity. I'm looking at one particular dissertation. Um, she's uh, one of my um, PhD students uh, at the University of Washington. Now she teaches at Evergreen College in Oregon. Jipar um, Dushanbieva. She argues in her dissertation that Ishan Ali Arabayev, Osman Ali Sidikov, or Belek Sultanayev, the Shiites did not make a complete break from the tradition of the Akans or Jamukchus who preceded them. What she's saying is, these revolutionaries tried to protect what is considered traditionally Kyrgyz ideas, but they also follow some of the new ideas. So she's talking about some kind of hybridity, respectfully, that these people, these important individuals follow. I argue the same when I discuss the four daughters of the Kyrgyz, the Kyrgyz in Turkish. But I want to turn to the people who came before these revolutionaries. Namely, to the thinkers uh, who became Arabai, Siddiqov Sultanev, and others set the stage for change without abandoning their roots. Um, you'll have to look at uh, Jipar's dissertation if you want to get a little more information on that. But Kyrgyz Manasjis, Akans, or Jumokjus represented the main Kyrgyz thinkers of the late imperial era. You all know better than I do these names. Uh, um, 
And there I rely on the scholarship I list uh, in the very bottom, as you see, as uh, some kind of like Mohammed Awas work. Um, influential accounts expressed the grievances of the Kyrgyz people in the Russian Empire in their writings. And they talked about the brutality of Russian military excursions under the Russian imperial religion. Kaladu, for example, lamented the divisiveness of military conflicts between uh, also two powerful tribes, uh, Sarabalish and Mughal. So they are not only targeting the Russian imperial forces, but they are also looking at the divisiveness between the various tribes. And they promoted a message of unity among Kyrgyz against the foreign enemy. Um, and Asan Khan of Obek Mohamedov, I have argued that Kalibu's early songs represented the Akhir Zaman uh, or the Judgment Day poetry that blamed the ills of the society on modernity, but pointed out that Kalibu eventually came to admit that modern education was the way of the future. You see what I mean by trying to accommodate both the traditional and the modern. I still have that. Yes. So, forgive me, I will try to read in Kyrgyz uh, uh one of uh, his poems here to sort of point to my uh, uh, argument. İlgerki nikarasın camanın cakşı tildegen Cakşısı ilim bilbegen, karanlılık uşunday, uşunday, arasında kavgulu, kavgu, yılagan közdün, cakşınday. So, forgive my Kyrgyz, but I think what he's trying to say, if you look at the past, a noble man scolded a bad man, the noble man had no knowledge of science, there was such darkness, Kalabul was among them, like a teardrop from the crying eye. So, his successors, uh, the creator of Tarzaman, the epic of irre irreparability, Arstambak uh, Buylashulu, sang about the devastating consequences of the Russian migrants into Kyrgyz and Kazakh lands and advocated the unified resistance of nomadic and Turkic people. These Akhans strongly implied that to be Kyrgyz and Kazakh, one needed to resist Russian colonial control. Then you have, of course, important individual mobile college, an influential Akhan of the Zarzaman movement, who have views more similar to reformist elites. Reformist elites come in the later period, as you see, Toktogul, Tobolok Moldo, and various other individuals who wrote, who lived through the transition from the imperial to the Soviet period, began writing or singing about the hardship that Kyrgyz people suffered in the hands of the monarchs and bias. Their songs targeted Russian Tsar, the Russian Tsar, the Muslim mullahs, and the so-called Kyrgyz aristocrats, more appropriately called the clan leaders. Skillful actors such as Toktogul appealed to the Kyrgyz audiences with songs that skillfully juxtaposed love of the Kyrgyz people and the environment, respect for the environment, and injustices committed against both. So, as you all know, Kyrgyz history better than I do, in the 20th century, Kyrgyz Tokrugu's name has become synonymous with Akin, and his songs signify the Russian revo the cultural revolution that followed the Bolshevik takeover. And I will not read his poetry to save you from my bad Kyrgyz uh, But Toktoku sang praises to those who valued hard work and diligence, 
but condemned those whom he called failures and freeloaders. He implied that Kyrgyzness needed to adopt certain, although selected, aspects of Russian life. So here, I invite you to think about the influence of these Aksakals on the young revolutionaries uh, and uh, six successful leaders of revolts who converted to modernity. So are we seeing these revolutionaries who challenged some of these ideas or are those revolutionaries who actually came up with their own ways of seeing the future? So um, let me go back quickly here. These are the scholars, oh sorry, the wrong one. These are the scholars that whose work have been influential in the West studying um, revolts and revolutions. They look at um, many aspects of revolution. They look at um, uh, various periods where um, revolutions took place. But I'd like to s uh, speak to one particular scholar's work. His name is Alexander Morrison. He's a British scholar who teaches now at, uh, in, in Nazarbayev University in uh, Astana. Um, he doesn't necessarily work on the revolution, but he looks at the imperial period, and he analyzes the construction of imperial citizenship in the late 19th and 20th century. He says, um, that the Russian imperial approach to Central Asian populations on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution resembled some of the civilizing processes of the 19th century, such as the British and French revolutions uh, in, uh, sorry, not revolutions, collectivization, not collectivization, colonialization in uh, British Africa and Asia. So let me revisit what I messed up here. What he argues that Russian colonization in Central Asia had some similarities between French and British colonization elsewhere. But he points out there was a difference. Because Russian administrators were more concerned about religious incompatibilities and they were fearful, fearful of back, cultural backsliding than what the British and French were worried about in Africa and Asia. In other words, Russian administrators treated the Muslim and Turkic populations uh, in a special way. They did not necessarily see these populations as uh, populations to be civilized. Their argument was all nationalities uh, in late imperial period had to be brought up culturally, not specifically, you know, targeting several several populations, such as the Muslims and Turkic populations. So it's important to examine this from a point of view of the metropole versus colony relations that became an analytical analytical. Another scholar, Daniel Brower, who analyzed the 1916 revolts, pointed out that the Kyrgyz revolutions, sorry, Kyrgyz populations did not revolt only because of the Russian imperial policy of the military conscription, but he, they also had other reasons to revolt against the empire. He argues, just like Morrison, the Russian imperial policies did not target Central Asians because they wanted to civilize them, but instead they had to struggle with two main realities. One, they had to deal with the problems with settlers from Western and Siberian parts of Russia. He argues that there was a vacillating policy of controlling numbers and behaviors of the Russian settlers. That was the first target. And the second one 
was the forced changes to indigenous and local administrative patterns. For example, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz file administration uh, and applying modern ideas to Kyrgyzites. So, I still have some more time. Uh, so, to revisit so far what I said about um, these individuals, <coughs> we need to think about, to, to return to my first introductory points, how do we study these things from a uh, theoretical point of view? If we look at two uh, or three uh, figures, uh, I won't repeat all these authors' names now, uh, because you know, you're not going to remember everybody's name, but uh, studying uprising and revolutions really can need to engage with theories of structure. First, we have to look at state-oriented approaches. They examine the struggle of, for self-determination, for opportunities, but also for autonomy. And the way in which we talk about rebellion really matters. What I mean is, language matters. How do we talk about those people who, whom we call rebels? How do we talk about those people who are going against the system? The way in which we talk about them really makes a, you know, important contribution in terms of how we understand uh, rebellions. Um, the narrator, the, the person who tells the, what happened in, in, you know, in a specific event in the past, their point of view is always subjective. As historians, we teach our students that we need to be objective about the past. My argument is it only depends on who's telling the story. So, the way in which the ways in which one talks about the 1916 uprising or we are talking about 1917 revolutions are also subjective. Although the revolution or the defi definition and the analysis of the phenomenon are, of revolts are subjective, they are important. First, we look at the Metropole Colony Liberations. I already pointed out Alexander Morrison's work. Uh, and Daniel Brower's work, but also we need to talk about significance of community. This is probably most important for Central Asian response to Bolshevik revolution. Re rebels and revolutionaries need to take risks, according to Roger Peterson. Rebels must sustain the rebellion against the powers of the regime, they need to take arms, they must have arms, they must have food, they must disseminate, disseminate information quickly, they must have transportable resistance. What do I mean by transportable resistance? They need to actually convince people who are participating in resistance that they have one goal. Uh, they must have an organization to hide from the authorities because they are, if they are caught, that's the end of the revolutionary movement. They also must recruit continuously to keep the revolution alive. So they need to influence people who are going to participate. And they also hunt down with those people who collaborate with the enemy. So we are also talking about quite a bit of violence as every revolution requires, or at least results in uh, uh, violence. All of this is only possible uh, if the rebels achieve community-based strength, meaning they actually have uh, a strong communities. How does that happen in Central Asia? This is probably a question we need to ask. Um, a community must be economically homogeneous, it must be socially heterogeneous. It must be politically underdeveloped. And the community members who become rebels 
must be highly motivated individuals. They must have the respect of influential people. But of course, as the Bolshevik Revolution constantly reminded us, they must be able to agitate. They must be able to constantly move uh, forward by agitating their populations. But not all societies with strong communities can sustain rebellion. One particular individual that will help us wrap all this up is Jack Goldstone's arguments. Weak state structures do not necessarily cause or sustain rebellions or revolutions. Structurally flawed regimes allow revolutionary movement and it requires, he identified, uh, four factors. Revolutionary leadership, of course there needs to be an ideology, identification with revolution, which is important, we have to identify with revolution to be able to sustain it, and also international pressures that might influence it. And I added one more factor myself from Paul Brass's work, who worked on both India and also in the Soviet Union. He talks about elite competition and elite conflict. So these are the theoretical approaches that may or may not be helpful for us to understand what happens in Central Asia. And, um, excuse me, to basically conclude and how to try to connect uh, my uh, points to specifically to Kyrgyzstan, going back to this very individual figure that influenced my work, uh, Sabira Kimsheleva, and various other theater uh, uh, uh, professionals in Central Asia. You probably will ask why these particular people. Because I think both the Bolsheviks and other modernists around the world used theater, later film, to advance their points of view. Uh, theater always participated and helped with ideologies and dissemination of ideologies. Later, of course, film, as we see Soviet theater and Soviet film have been highly influential. But in particular in Central Asia, um, with people like these Akins I talked about, but later, of course, uh, people like James like Matov and other writers who started writing in the 50s and later, uh, with Soviet realism and various other genres, they also brought in the significance of gender, significance of women's role. And as a result, people like um, Kim Shelyeva and various others who were in educated in schools like this. I found this in an archive here in Bishke, in Osh actually. Uh, this is an Uzuk Uchkur school of Tekeldesh. As you see, there's one teacher in 1924 educating these young Kyrgyz uh, pupils. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, the photograph did not have any names other than her name. I don't know if these little girls and boys were you know, who they were, but hoping maybe that person looks very much like Sabira Kimsheleva, possibly that's her, but the four people who may, whom you may be familiar with, uh, Sayira Kispaeva, uh, Sabira Kimsheleva, Bakin Kitikeva, and uh, Dark Kukova, uh, those of you who may have seen films or uh, plays or at least read about them, um, why do I bring these people up? These, are, these people are very much the products of the Bolshevik Revolution. They were, when I interviewed Sadra Kimsheleva, she said, without the revolution, without these ideas, these modern ideas, she said she would probably be a shepherdess. Now she's an actress who, you know, is fluent, not only fluent in Russian, but uh, she also upholds her Kyrgyz culture, how a Kyrgyz woman, a young woman, and a Kyrgyz, you know, 
uh, intellectuals should act. So they took on two roles. They took on one, showing the modernity of Muslim women who could become professionals, who could become theater individuals and influential figures. Two, they had to also be the, basically, uh, they kept the tradition alive by playing in, you know, plays that were written by uh, Jim Saitmuda or others, playing certain roles like, you know, uh, um, various, you know, like Akkeme and various other plays. They sort of represented Kyrgyzness, but also, they also represented what meant to be modern for these individuals, because their gender had an important part, uh, played an important part in these revolutions. Thank you for your attention, and I will stop here, and hopefully we'll have questions about this. Thank you.